Welcome, I'm Bruce Munro, and with me is International Relations Specialist, Professor Robert Batman, and this is Global Insight. We're already a month into 2020, but we want to pause and consider what is on the horizon for this year. Welcome, Robert. Morning, Bruce. Internationally, a lot is already going on. Mm. Which are you picking as the geopolitical hotspots to watch out for? Well, we're in an era of global transition. Um, American dominance of the early 90s has receded. The so-called unipolar moment has gone, and it's being replaced by an increasingly fragmented international system in which there is great power rivalry. Uh, but we are, some of the old assumptions and some the old certainties, and I think some of the conventional wisdoms are under challenge now. And it's against that backdrop in which there's a, a number of, I think, hotspots to watch in 2020. One is the United States. It has a presidential election coming up. And now you may say, oh, this is just domestic politics, but America is the one of the major engines of the global economy. And therefore, what happens in the United States does have huge uh, ripples effects in, in the international system. Mr. Trump's undergoing the impeachment process at the moment. Some commentators believe that Mr. Trump has had quite a negative effect on the global economy. He's engaged in a trade war with China. And there are also some disquieting signs um, looking forward about the American economy. Debt in the United States has piled up. Mr. Trump has cut taxes and um, at the same time increased military expenditure. Uh, the military in the United States is at this, at this as we speak, is 2020, it's uh, absorbing about $750 billion a year. And um, so the, there's some worrying signs there. And also the manufacturing index in the US has continued to drop month by month. So although Mr. Trump says the economy has never been in better shape, Quite a few economists are beginning to question that. In short, there's a slight fragility about the economy in the United States that could have global repercussions. And that's something to watch, I think. And coming back to the impeachment process, there may be international observers who hope that it's successful and Mr. Trump's removed and that a new presidency might, first of all, restore America's reputation because many people outside the United States and indeed within it believe that the United States leadership has suffered recently. Um, but there are those who argue that the Democrats by engaging the president in the impeachment process may be distracting Americans from those issues which could hurt Mr. Trump at the poll. For example, the fact um, that some of the, some of the indicators that we were just speaking about, that there are signs that manufacturing is really seriously slowing down and that um, many people are find their, li their lifestyle and their living standards continue to be challenged. So there is a fear that by holding Mr. Trump for account for a corruption or even treason, you know, the Democrats may be distracting many ordinary voters from the issues that really matter to them, um, namely the state of the economy and their, whether their jobs are secure. Um, the other, a couple of other hotspots, I think, to watch um, I think China um, is another superpower which is also having legitimacy problems at home. Um, it hasn't hit the headlines too much, but the Chinese are dealing with considerable difficulty of a problem with a Muslim minority in China, and that is beginning to get into the international headlines, um, the Uyghurs. Um, something like between 1 million and 1.5 million Uyghurs have been detained in facilities likened to concentration camps. And there's the problem of Hong Kong. The Chinese leadership really faces a very difficult problem here because on the one hand, they may be tempted to simply intervene and crush the democracy uprising in Hong Kong. If they do that, they risk self-inflicted damage on their economic relations with key markets like Japan, the United States, and the EU. But if they don't do something, then the democracy movement has the possibility of spreading to within China itself. So that, that's a worry for the Chinese leadership. And I think uh, there are certainly signs, interestingly, in 2020, 
that the two superpowers are facing challenging internal situations with international reverberations. Uh, a third hotspot, I think, is Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been involved in quite an unproductive intervention in Yemen for the last few years, and there are also signs uh, that uh, the leadership, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, is beginning to face challenges within Saudi Arabia. So, for, for, you know, in many respects, um, uh, commentators on the Middle East, for example, argue that the Saudi regime looks more shaky than any time for the last 50 years. And of course, that, that is a big concern to a number of Western countries, not least the United States. What are you picking as the big issue of 2020? Well, the figures are in. We now know that we've had the hottest decade in human history uh, for the last 10 years. So I think um, the climate issue is not going to go away. And the data um, is probably going to, we've seen terrible wildfire, wildfires in Australia recently. Uh, we've seen um, the Antarctic and Arctic melting at an alarming rate. And we are seeing uh, climate fueled migrations. So we're beginning to get an alarming picture build up. And let's face it, we've known about this problem for the best part of two or three decades. But I think the issue now is beginning to really gain momentum and particularly amongst young people who are quite angry at um, what might be described as many of, the, at many of the people who are in power at the moment, they feel there's not enough being done. The scale of the problem to fix the problem is enormous, Bruce. Um, because it's been neglected for so long, to get uh, emissions down to the 1.5% level suggested by the UN, um, that would take a, a massive attempt or massive program of reducing carbon emissions by about 7.6% in each country of the world. And we're nowhere near that in New Zealand, for example. So there, this is quite a, a, we've got a decade basically to try to get on top of this problem. And I just believe this is an issue, it's not gonna go away. And I think there's increasingly, people who deny there's a problem are gonna run into the, the objective evidence. And uh, so I do think it could be a, a, catalyst, a, a catalyst this year, I think, for finally getting a much more concerted and internationally orchestrated attempt to deal with this problem, which threatens not just human life, but threatens the extinction of up to a million, million um, animal uh, type species of animals and plants on the planet. So this is a major problem. What role will New Zealand have this year? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, we have an election as well, so that might make us a little bit risk averse in foreign policy terms. But I think, Bruce, that one of the key lessons of the Christchurch atrocity is that New Zealand has to become a little bit more active in defending its values and, act, uh, and values and interests internationally. We can't afford to rely on old partners whose own worldviews have departed from ours. For example, the United Kingdom under the Johnson administration or Johnson government and the Trump administration. Uh, New Zealand has a different worldview from those countries. And increasingly, um, we are seeing uh, things that New Zealand needs internationally, such as a rules-based order under threat. So I think there's an incentive now for New Zealand. I'm not saying that New Zealand should any way go it alone. There are signs, promising signs, that New Zealand and a number of other countries are beginning to mobilise and collaborate um, to defend their common interests. An example of this occurred recently January of this year, when um, the EU, New Zealand, and 15 other members of the WTO started putting in place arrangements so that the, tra the, the, the process of resolving trade disputes within the WTO could continue despite the fact that the United States has effectively been putting that organization under the cosh for the last two years or so. So there are the beginnings, I think, of a realization of the, amongst the smaller countries and the middle-sized countries that they are actually the majority in the international system and they can't rely on the great powers uh, who have their own problems, as we said earlier. And, um, you know, so we may see, you know, without pushing it too much, maybe the 20, 2020 will be the year that New Zealand begins to 
uh, become a much more active foreign policy player, perhaps a minor power rather than a small state as it sometimes describes itself. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Bruce. We'll be watching with interest. And thank you for watching. Catch us next time on Global Insight. Sai Jian.